Okay, everybody, we seem to be holding steady at 28 participants. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I want to thank everybody for joining us for our first CCHCSP session that we are hosting in collaboration with the Hematology Oncology Fellows at SickKids. Um, so I'm very excited. And I am now going to hand this over to Natalie Matthews, one of the co-chair, sorry, co-chief fellows within the Hematology Oncology Group. Thanks, Linda. Uh, so I have the pleasure today of introducing Dr. Furkan Sheikh. He's a staff oncologist in the solid tumor section at the Hospital for Sick Children and an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. He's a project investigator within the Child Health Evaluative Sciences team at SickKids and is the director of the Hemonc Fellows Continuity Clinic. His main areas of, in of research include rare pediatric tumors and supportive care in oncology and has published extensively in these areas. Dr. Sheikh's CV is too long to do justice in these few moments, but it includes many research and teaching awards. So we're honored to have Dr. Sheikh give this first uh, curriculum develop, career development curriculum lecture for the Hemonc Fellows in conjunction with the CCHCSP. So take it away, Furkan. Thank you, Linda and Natalie. I um, truly appreciate that, that kind introduction. Wow, I didn't realize this is the first one. I feel honored and a little uh, <laughs> uh, maybe burdened. Um, so, and I see lots of new, uh, new names in the, in the room. So um, I imagine many of our, our, the CCHCSP students are a part of that. Sorry for the code white. Code white. Atrium, dentistry, all clear, Cordway, atrium, dentistry, all clear. All right. Um, so yes, it's a, it's an honor to be here, and um, you know this is really an introduction to research analysis. I'm not myself a biostatistician. I'm not. I don't have a PhD in in clinical epidemiology. I do have a master's, and so I'm really you know I've designed this particular lecture to be. Um, targeted towards someone um, very, very just perhaps junior in their in their research journey. So, if anyone in this room is you know completing their second PhD, I apologize in advance for for what may what may be sound basic to you, and maybe even in some parts a little scandalous at its at its simplification. Uh, but the goal really here is to to um, give just enough you know um, of an introduction to research analysis in 50 minutes for for people to at least start putting fingers to keyboard and starting their first um, you know research proposal or research project write up um, so so that's my intention today I believe one of the sort of subtitles of this talk that perhaps I think Natalie you had come up with was was fake it till you make it and I, and I wasn't sure if I should put that officially because I don't want to be accused of, of teaching my students to, to fake it uh, but I think that that was quite apropos because the, the way I sort of see it is there's a bit of a vicious cycle in research analysis it's uh, or, or kind of like a catch-22 it's kind of like that whole you know you need an experience to get a job and you need a job to get experience so in research analysis you sort of need you need to you need a you know you need a statistical plan to get a statistical plan ideally you want a statistician or, a, or an advanced clinical epidemiologist but to get their help you often need research funding to get research funding you need a grant to get a grant you need to be able to write a research proposal and to write a research proposal, you need a statistical plan. <laughs> so there's this circle about, well, how do I how do I enter that circle? And I think the way to enter that circle is to to fake it till you make it, which is to be able to write a research analysis section even before you can do research analysis, to be able to write it just enough that you can get your foot in the door. And then while you're doing that project, you know, learn the statistics, maybe do your master's or, or, or get some friends in the statistical department to help you further along the way. But that's really my goal today is to get you started. Um, and, and the way I'm gonna do that is, um, I'm trying to advance my screen, but I can't. Oh, there we go. Yes. Um, the way to do that is the, 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 you know, this lecture is sort of based on this eureka moment that I had, uh, and I'm going to share with you that eureka moment, and it's really tied along sort of uh, two concepts. One is the types of variables, and the other is the the contents of the analysis section. And I'm going to start off. This is probably the most important slide uh, of this hour. So I'm gonna start off with this question and the answer to this question is sort of gonna launch us into what I mean by, by my Eureka moment uh, and to see how to get started on a, on a research analysis. So if everyone can unmute their mics, I want everyone to participate and interact. Um, which of the following factors 
I, I should say most determines the choice of statistical test that is performed. Because each of these factors does to some extent determine the choice of statistical test, but which one is the most influential? Is it the type of outcome variable? Is it the type of predictor variable? Is it the normality of the distribution of the outcome variable? Or is it the number of outcomes per measure? I wanna hear lots of voices, what do people think? I don't hear anything. Come on, folks, be brave. A is my guess. What's that? A is my guess. A example. is your guess, okay. A is mine as well. All right. Well, the normality is also pretty important, I would say. Pretty important. So which it's one of those maybe. I don't know if I would go with C, but I would give a maybe there. Okay, okay good. I'm glad to see a little bit of diversity in, in answers. Well, who else? Come on, folks. I'm gonna pick on names. There are also a couple of A's in the text chat. Oh, there's some text happening. Oh, good. Uh, all right, because I'm sharing my screen, I don't think I can see that. All right, uh, hopefully there's some participation happening there. So I'm gonna say for me, the best answer is A, the type of outcome or dependent variable. And as Gustavo said, all of these actually are important and we'll see how they sort of, how they factor in. But, you know, it's kind of like, you know, if, you were, if I was to ask you what's the most important blood test in working up someone's anemia, you might say, well, there's so many, right? You need the ferritin and the iron, but I would say the most important is the reticulocyte count because it's the first thing that puts you in the, the fork in the road between increased production or uh, increased consumption. And so I, f I think similarly, A, the type of outcome variable is the first sort of fork in the road to tell you where, where everything else fits in. And I'll show, I'll explain why hopefully soon. I'm having trouble advancing. Oh. Okay. Yes, so, so this is why. So the type of outcome, when we talk about that, we often talk about outcome being like this, uh, one continuous data, two categorical data, three survival or time to event data, and four count data. So what do these mean? So continuous data is typically something measured with an instrument. This would be things like height, blood pressure, viral load. It's typically things that have a number, maybe might have a decimal spot as well, but it's a quantity of some sort that's measured on a continuous scale. Categorical data is data that has states. Now we most often use binary, so binary is a subgroup of categorical data. And, uh, and let's focus on binary because it's the most common thing in research projects. So we have two or more states, they may be thought of as success or failure. So it might be patient alive versus dead, cured versus not cured. It could be tripartite such as mild, moderate, severe, um, you know, low risk, moderate, uh, standard risk, high risk, et cetera, et cetera. So there's some kind of categorical um, situation. Um, and this typically is not, you can't describe it in numbers, but you can use a number to describe the proportion of each, right? The proportion of success and the failure. Then there's something called survival data or time to event data. And if you're in oncology, you're of course very familiar with this. And you're interested in this case in the time to some event, and that, that event may or may not happen to all patients. So this could be the time to relapse or the time to death um, or the time to your next vomiting, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's number four, which is um, something that most oncologists are not that familiar working with, uh, and that is count data where the frequency of data is important. For example, the number of vomits per day. In oncology, you know, you can't talk about the number of relapses or the number of deaths. So we often typically don't see, are not very familiar with count data. And that means I'm not very familiar with count data. So I won't focus very much on that for the rest of this talk, but at least it's there. So you know that that's something that exists. Now, here's the question. How would you, how would you measure headaches as each of these types of data? So I want everyone to unmute. Tell me what you, if you had a study, you were a headache, physician and you wanted to do a study, your first question is how am I going to measure my outcome? So how would you measure your outcome according to continuous categorical survival or count for headaches? Two. Sorry, Mohamed? Uh, I said two. Uh, no, no, this like, is not, um, a, this is, not a, 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 this is a all one by one. I want an answer for each one of these. So if you were doing a study where headache was measured as continuous data, what would that look like? Like maybe the, the, the duration of hours of headaches, uh, headache or minutes. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. What else could you do with continuous data? Severity of headaches? Yeah, severity of headaches on some kind of scale, right? Maybe a 10 point scale or a facey scale. Yeah, so the severity of headache would be a continuous data. What would, how would you categorize it if it was categorical data? 
Headache or no headache. <laughs> yep, you could do headache or no headache. What else could you do? I guess you could do like if you were looking at migraine, like aura or no aura, like are there particular features that you're interested yep. in? Yeah, sure. I mean, that may be a sort of ancillary variable. It may not be your primary outcome variable, uh, but I suppose it could be if, if the aura was bothersome. Mm -hmm. What else could you do categorically? Mild, moderate. Mild, moderate, and severe. Exactly. You could do mild, moderate, severe. You could just do severe headache versus not severe headache, right? So if they have mild or moderate, that's still a success. But if they have severe, that's a failure. Yeah, those kind of things. And what would you do for survival or time to event data for a headache? Time to relief of headache. Um, that one may be tricky. That one may fall better into continuous data, all right? But it may just be something like time to next headache, right? right? Or whether people even, and, and that would allow you, you know, to show certain people don't get the headache at all, right? So you could have a Kaplan-Meier curve of, you know, your, your time, you know, um, headache-free survival, basically, right? And so if your headache-free survival was, was 80%, that would tell you, you know, 80% of patients didn't get a headache. Um, so it's both time and kind of a proportion estimate as well. And then what would you do for count data? Could you do number of headaches? Exactly. So this is where the frequency would come in, right? So it would be something like number of headaches, right? maybe number of migraine attacks per month, etc. So you see how the same outcome variable can actually be categorized in any one of these. And no one can tell you which is the right one to choose. You have to choose that as the investigator, right? But obviously certain things will lend themselves more more commonly and more, more allowably to, to particular ones of these. But once you've made that choice, that's when, okay, that's when everything gets started. So I'm um, actually, I'm gonna skip ahead a slide. I'm gonna show you guys this three by four table. So this is like the bottom line, like the Eureka moment, as I said. So um, I, I guess I could have put count data here and had a four by four table, but because I said, I'm not, I myself don't use count data. I've used, but the three that, you know, me and my, uh, our fellows will be most commonly familiar with, but you could make this a four by four table. And so you say continuous binary survival and count is the type of um, outcome variables. And then the contents of your research section are descriptive, graphic, primary, and secondary. And I'm gonna talk about what each of those are. And then if you actually fill in this four by four table, you really have analysis in a nutshell. Uh, and it's sort of your starting point. And once you fill that in, you can almost then look at that um, result as like a cheat sheet for how to write your, your analysis section. Um, so, so this is what I mean by analysis section. So every analysis section should have, uh, uh, the first paragraph should be on your descriptive statistics. The next paragraph should be on your graphical analysis. The third paragraph should be on your primary analysis. And that's really the effect size and the hypothesis testing. So that's where we start talking about things like relative risk and p-values or confidence intervals, et cetera. And then the last thing is your secondary analysis, by which I mainly mean your adjusted analysis. In most cases, that's your regression, how you account for confounders. It could be other choices. You could use certification, uh, et cetera, to account for adjusters. And then in your secondary analysis, it's also every other kind of analysis. So you might do a sensitivity analysis. You might do a subgroup analysis, et cetera. You could also, in your analysis section, put in a sample size estimation. Um, we'll talk briefly about that. But, but that's really you know, how you write your analysis section. And so, that, as I said, you come up with this four by four group graph and you just go across the rows. And so I'll sort of show you what the cheat sheet looks like and then we'll actually work for the rest of the hour, we'll work through you know, each of these cells in more detail and see where this comes from. So very briefly, if you're talking about continuous data, then your descriptive statistic is either a mean and a standard deviation if things are normally distributed or a median and a range if they're not normally distributed. Your graphical representation will be line plots, box plots, and bar graphs. Your primary outcome measure will be mean difference, right? Because let's say you have mean headache score of 7.5 with the, uh, you know, your, your migraine medication and you have a mean of you know, headache score of 9.5 without um, medication then that's your mean difference. And the way you would test that would be, for example, with a t-test if they were normally distributed. Uh, and yes, you will have access to these slides uh, later. I just saw that comment. Uh, my pleasure to share that. And then if you wanted to do secondary analysis, like an adjustment for confounders, you would use a technique called linear regression. So all of this will make a little more sense throughout the course of this hour. If you have a binary outcome, let's say you know headache or no headache, then your descriptive statistics is the percentage and the proportion. Your graphical analysis is the bar graph and the pie chart. Your primary statistical analysis is the relative risk or the odds ratio. 
And to test the statistical significance of that, you would use the chi-square test. And your secondary analysis is the logistic regression. If you have a survival outcome, your primary descriptive statistic is the median survival. Um, which can be either EFS or OS, and usually that's plus or minus a standard error or a standard deviation. Your um, primary graphical representation is a Kaplan-Meier curve. Your primary outcome measure is the survival difference, and the test of significance is usually the log rank test. And then your secondary analysis is the Co Cox proportional hazard regression. So right away, guys, even as I said that, <laughs> you're faking it until you make it, right? You may not know how to do a Cox proportional hazards regression, but you can at least write into your grant application, I'm going to test for the effect of confounding covariables by using Cox proportional hazards regression. And now you've got a year to actually figure out how to do it, right? But but at least it's there. So that's sort of what I wanted to get, get across today. Um, any statisticians in the room are probably cringing at my, my simplification here. All right, if I can figure out how to change slides, I will. I don't know if there's just a lag. Okay. All right. So again, um, you know, we already talked about the top few headers. And then there's a, you know, as I said, you can do other things in your analysis section. So you can do your subgroup analysis, your sensitivity analysis, maybe your validation analysis, maybe an economic analysis. You can add some details, like is your test going to be one-sided or two-sided? In most cases, it has to be two-sided. You can talk about significance level. You know, by convention, we use 5%, but there's no reason it has to be that for every study. You can talk about adjusting for multiple comparisons. If you're doing a lot of uh, comparisons, do you have to do like a Bonferroni correction or something like that? You can talk about how you're going to handle missing data. Are you going to use imputation for missing data, et cetera? And then if you have a repeated measures analysis, what I mean by that is your subjects, you know, get the same measure um, over time. So for example, if you're doing a study of, let's say, um, let's say LPs in, in, in a procedure room for oncology patients and each patient gets 30 LPs, then you have to use a statistical method that appropriately handles uh, clustering or repeated measures. So these are the finer nuances and details and I'm not gonna really get into any of these and chances are most of you for your fellows project are not gonna be doing complicated you know, uh, adjustments and imputations or bootstrapping or, or repeated measures analyses. Maybe you are, but that's really where you're probably gonna want either want a statistical friend or a, or a master's in ClinEpi. But for most of your core fellow projects, you're probably not getting into those kind of details. And then eventually you want a sample size estimation. And for, by and large, you can actually rely on online calculators to, to help you with that. Um, and importantly, you want to plan everything you're going to do in advance. So the choice of statistical test is not inappropriately influenced by the data. Right? And that's very important. You don't want to, um, um, you know, sort of say, I'm gonna collect the data and then I'll figure out how I'm gonna analyze that later because that's really an you know, enticement to, to do data mining or data dredging, right? And, and you're, you, know, you can find anything significant if you look hard enough, uh, but, you, but you have to hold yourself to honesty and you have to say, I only did the comparisons that I set out to do and I wasn't going out there, you know, p-fishing, p-value fishing, looking for something to publish because um, that's not good science. All right, so very briefly, um, I'm gonna go through each of those sections now. So when we talk about descriptive, so, so in a way, so this slide here, I'm talking about descriptive statistics and I'm talking about continuous data, right? So if you go back to my, my four by four um, you know, cheat sheet, I'm talking about that first cell, right? Continuous data, descriptive statistic. So everyone has seen the beautiful bell curve, right? And if something is distributed on, on the bell curve, on the Gaussian distribution, then we're, then we're saying it's normally distributed. And the good thing about the bell curve is you can basically describe all of it by two things, right? The mean and the variance. And the variance then correlates with the standard deviation. And two standard deviations, typically what we think about when we say 95% confidence interval. Um, so that's your, your normally distributed continuous uh, variable, right? So this could be something like height in the population, for example. Um, all right. And then if things are not normally distributed, then they're skewed, right? Either leftward or rightward. There's still a curve, but it's a, not, a, not a normal curve. Uh, and in a normal curve, the mode, the median, and the mean all overlap. But in a non-normal curve, they get skewed like this. Usually the mode is to the left, the median, and then the mean. And in a non-normal distribution, the convention is that it's better not to use mean and standard deviation, but it's actually better to use median and either range or interquartile range. So, um, right away, we've got our continuous variable with descriptive statistics, and we're saying we're going to describe one measure of central tendency and one measure of dispersion. So that's either mean and standard deviation if normally distributed, or mean, interquartile range, and range if not normally distributed. 
Um, next, we have binary, and we're talking about descriptive statistics. So remember when I said the two states themselves are not usually numeric, right? Um, being alive or dead or being cured or not cured or being severe headache or not severe headache is not itself a numeric entity, but their frequency is numeric. So you can describe the absolute number. So if you have 100 patients and 70 are cured, then your absolute number is 70 and your frequency is 70%. Or you can describe that as a proportion, you know, 0 0.7 or 7 out of 10. So you can numerify the, the, the relative proportion of each, even though the entity is not numeric. And so that often gives you your table one, right? Your table one in any paper is your patient demographic and clinical characteristic. And while we're on that topic, what a very good habit for your, you know, for your initial research proposal or your initial grant application is to create dummy tables. And what I mean by dummy tables is create the entire table one without the numbers. You obviously don't have the numbers because you haven't done the study yet, but you can create your dummy table, meaning the empty table, into which you're going to add the numbers once your study is completed. And you should do that really for everything in your study. You should do that for your table one study characteristics. You should do that for your flow of patients through the study. You should do that for your um, you know, summary of outcomes. You should do that for your uh, regression analysis. Just actually create the dummy tables and don't fill in the numbers. And then what you've done is you've, you've, you know, you've half written your manuscript, right? Your research proposal is your background and your method and you've got your dummy tables. Now all you need to do is add in the results on the discussion once you're done the study. But you really should be able to think about your study at that advanced level before you start putting patients on it. Um, so this is what, you know, table one looks like. And what you can see in most oncology table ones, a lot of what we collect is categorical, right? So you've got sex, male, female, you've got race. Here's an example of categorical that's not binary. Uh, ethnicity, and you've got the primary site, right? Again, categorical, but not binary. And so all you're describing is number of patients and their percentage. And you can break it down by regimen A and regimen B, and then you can Count, uh, sum all of them and say all patients. So you can have you know, six columns. There's only one um, place here where they've described a continuous variable and that's age. And you can see it was not normally distributed. So they gave you the median and the range, um, but they also broke it down into age groups. So they took a continuous variable and categorized it and they give you both, right? So they give you the category in this column and then they sort of did a mid column, if you will, and put the for the continuous. So you can see this table has a mix of continuous descriptives and categorical descriptives. And this is another way to do it. This is one of my papers. Um, so you can see I had a mix in my descriptive table. I had a mix of continuous variables and I used mean and range and categorical variables where I used number and percentage. And so I just put my continuous ones on top with age of diagnosis and number of asparaginase doses. And I put my categorical variables, sex and disease type at the bottom. So, so that's all you do for your table one, but in your analysis section, you describe that you're going to do this, right? So it gets you your first paragraph. And then very often you can do a figure one, which is sort of your prisma flow chart or your flow of patients through the study. So if you're doing a trial, you can do enrolled, eligible, various regimens, and then what, you know, what happened. Uh, but if you're doing not a trial, but like a chart review study, you can do something very similar, right? You can be like charts reviewed, deemed eligible, et cetera, et cetera. So figure one Prisma flow chart is a very helpful thing to, to describe and to do a dummy chart for as well. All right, so that's all descriptive statistics. Now I'm gonna talk briefly about graphical statistics and maybe I'll pause then and take some questions before we go into uh, primary and secondary. So, you know, people often forget the graphical statistics when they're writing their research analysis because they sort of think, well, I'll just do the graphs later. But no, you may as well get that second paragraph in there and describe how you're gonna physically represent your data, right? A picture is worth a thousand words. So very simple. For continuous data, the way to show it graphically is through box. You can show it through, a, you can show it through, I guess, a bell curve as well, but that's not very common for some reason in studies. We often sort of schematize the bell curve into a box plot. Um, you could show bar graphs, you could show scatter plots and line plots. For binary data, you're often showing bar graphs or pie charts. And for survival data, of course, you're showing Kaplan-Meier curves. So this is what a box and whisker plot looks like. It's sort of like a, a, a bell, sorry, kind of a code white. It's sort of a bell curve, you know, turned on its side so that instead of looking at it coronally, you're looking at it, uh, you know, axially, if you will. Um, so the, so the, usually the middle line is the, the mean um, uh, or the median, you could specify. Usually the first line then is sort of your, um, so I guess if, you're, if, you're, if it's normally distributed, you do mean, um, first standard deviation and second standard deviation. If it's not only distributed, you could do median, interquartile range, and actual range. 
uh, et cetera, et cetera. So usually box underscore plot, I guess it's usually mean uh, that they show, but that's how you would show it. And this would be a scatter and a line plot. So if you had like two, if, if this, this works if your dependent variable is continuous and your predictor variable is continuous. So you can plot both of them. So for example, let's say this could be like dose of blood pressure medicine versus blood pressure medicine difference kind of thing, right? Or this could be like, you know, Years on growth hormone versus yeah, I'm not know. Like I'm, I'm gonna develop some so yeah. Um, so does that make so? If, so you can you should use a scatter plot and a line plot if if both your outcome variable and your predictor variable are are continuous. And you know you can have many different you could you could put a line on anything, but it's not always appropriate to have a line through through data. You know this scatter plot here you may say has a line of best fit, but this. You know this data here. You've drawn a line through it, but maybe it wasn't appropriate to call it a line, right? This may actually be a parabolic, you know, a curve of best fit. And so, if you force a line of best fit through this, you know, you've you've misrepresented the data. Um, here, I suppose you could you could have a line of best fit, but you have to account for one outlier. That one outlier is skewing the the truth of the line uh, by a lot. And here again, of course, this is not continuous data, right? This is almost categorical data or binary data. So you've made a mistake here by calling the, by making a line of best fit. Uh, this this may be better summed as a, as a you know bar chart, a categorical data summary. Um, and this is of course what a Kaplan-Meier curve looks like. Many of you have seen that. Uh, typically, you know, one curve or two curve. Every notch that goes down is an event that's happening, right? So it could be a, in this case it's survival. So every notch down is is a patient dying of their of their cancer. And then there's a predictor variable, which is WT1 expression. And what they haven't shown on this curve is the sensor notches, but every time a patient um, hasn't had the event, but has completed their follow-up, they usually have a sensor notch on the curve. And while that doesn't cause a drop of the curve, it does change the denominator that the curve is working on in the background. And that's why very often kaplan meier curves, as you get closer to the right, you'll see these very large drop-offs, like you'll see a half a drop-off. Does that mean that half the patients died? No, that means you only had two patients left and one of them died, um, right? So, so you, you typically get the steps get, get bigger as you go along because the underlying denominator is getting smaller because the patients are being censored as you go along the curve. You know, we could spend a whole hour talking about kaplan meier curves. In fact, that'll be a really fun hour for me, but, but I guess it's not the day to day. Um, so, so that's what uh, kaplan meier vanal curves look like. All right, so I'll pause here for maybe two minutes of questions before we go into primary analysis and secondary analysis. So everyone unmute their mics and ask me questions. Sorry, can you explain that about the kaplan meier curve again, just with how your denominator changes? I just wanna make sure I understand what you were saying about the notches. Yeah, you know, I apologize. Um, I'd love yeah. to explain it. I, I, you know, the, the best way to really go through a kaplan meier curve is to actually do the math in the background. And you just have to do it once in your life and you'll have like this Eureka moment and you'll never forget it again. But of course we, you know, that'll, that as I said, will be a whole hour in and of itself. But the basic idea is that, so, so let's take this blue line, which is WT1 expression, right? So let's, so we have 113 patients starting off. So that means on year zero of study right up here, you have 113 patients. Um, over here on the right side of the curve, you have zero patients, right? All your patients have completed the study, meaning somewhere between zero years and seven years, all of your patients left the study. Now they left the study in one of two ways. They either left the study because they died and every time they died, the kaplan meier curve had a downward deflection or they left the study because you know, they were seen for four years and that's just the last time you saw them. Now that doesn't necessarily mean they stopped coming to you after four years. It may just be that they joined the study four years ago and you saw them yesterday and that was just the last time you saw them, right? So they would be a four year, they would be censored at four years. So censored basically means not having an event, but no longer seen beyond that point. So they can be censored either because they got lost to follow up or because they're not lost to follow up, but they've just completed that many years of follow up. So many kaplan meier curves will have these ver uh, vertical lines and those are the sensor notches, but most journals remove them because they, they, they think they create, you know, noise. I actually love it when they, when they're there because you can see, you know, when, how often patients were, how long they were followed. Did most of them drop off early or did most of them complete the study for a long period of time? So it's very helpful to actually have them. But what the sensor notches are doing in the background is every time um, the deflection happens downwards, it's a proportion of how many patients are still in the study. So let's say that by this point in the study, you have 50 uh, patients left. That downward deflection there is 1 50th, right? So if you measured the height of this curve from 
the bottom, sorry, from the bottom to here, then that deflection would be 1 50th. If, you, if there was 25 patients left on this part of the study, then that deflection would be uh, you know, 1 25th. So that's probably a very, doesn't do it justice because it was so rushed, um, but I hope that helped a little bit. But really, oh, that's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, so the no. magnitude of your deflection reflects the change in the denominator. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And the denominator. I don't that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and thanks. the denominator is changing for two reasons. One is the events, and the other is the censoring. So every time someone dies, they've left the study, and every time someone has their last follow-up, they've left the study. And so in the background, the denominator is changing continuously across the line. Right. Yeah. No. If, if people want, we can come back and do an hour of Kaplan markers. I'd be very happy to, to do that again. <laughs> but, but we have other things to talk about. Um, yeah. Okay. So that's a very good question. So let's move on. Um, so we're talking now about primary analysis. This is probably maybe the most important part of, of this talk. So in the primary analysis, what you're really describing is effect size and the significance testing or the hypothesis testing. And people get these two things confused all the time. And I actually would argue that people put the emphasis on the wrong place because they put the emphasis more often on the hypothesis testing or the significance testing than on the effect size. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean a little bit. So for continuous data, your effect size is typically your mean difference. Remember, you have a group A and you have a mean from it, and you have a group B and you have a mean from it. So your effect size is actually your mean difference, right? So this drug led to a drop in you know, mean headache score of 2.4 points, right? That's your, that's your effect size. And then what you do with your hypothesis test or your significance test is you say, did this, could this result have come from chance alone, right? Based on my sample, oops, sorry, based on my sample size and my results, um, um, could it be that this result came, came from chance alone, from random distribution, or could it be that it was truly produced by the steady intervention? And that's really what p-values and confidence intervals are all about and what these tests are all about. So the hypothesis test you do for a continuous variable really depends on, um, this is where the normality comes in, uh, Gustavo, to your point, right? So if you've got a two-group comparison and they're both normally distributed, then you would use your good old fashioned student's t-test, right? It's really, it's called a student t-test, but it's not like you learn the, the, the professor's t-test later, right? It's the same t-test, right? We just all use it. It's a good old simple test. Um, if you've got more than two groups and they're normally distributed, you use this thing called the NOVA. If they're not normally distributed, meaning non-parametric, then you use this thing called Wilcoxon rank sum test. And if, they're, if you have particular paired data, and I don't know if I'll have time to go into that, but sort of maybe like two time points, you know, or two, two sort of outcomes per patient, like before and after kind of data, then you would use a McNemer's test. So, you know, we're just faking it till you make it. So I'm just going to tell you guys, you know, in your analysis, you just write down, I will use the student T test for my comparison. And then you have a year to figure out how to do it. Um, similarly, for your binary outcome, um, you all write, um, uh, the, the, the primary outcome is your relative risk or your odds ratio. And often you can describe both as well. And, and which one you choose, um, you know, sort of depends on, uh, on what kind of study you have. If you're doing like a prospective uh, analysis, um, uh, then you're typically using a relative risk. If it's, if it's retrospective, like a case, uh, case control, then you're using your odds ratio. If you've used logistic regression, you get an odds ratio out of that. Um, but either one, you get these both out of your two by two table. And then that's your effect size is your relative risk and your odds ratio. And then um, uh, this, the, the hypothesis test is your chi-square test. Or if you don't have enough of a sample size to do a chi-square test, then you do, then there's like a low sample size version of that called the Fisher's exact test. So if any one of your two by two tables has a cell size with less than five participants, then you do a Fisher's exact test. And then your survival outcome is your survival difference. Right, so people think it's the median survival, right? But the median survival is just a point descriptor of your Kaplan Meier curve, right? But but you can you can pick up you know you can pick a point of survival, like you can say the five year survival, and then you can describe the difference between the two treatments of the five year survival, right? So with standard, you know, VDC for Ewing sarcoma, you got seventy seven percent survival, and with or like, uh, and with compressed VDC, you got eighty five percent survival. So your survival difference at five years would be uh, 8%, right? And then your log rank test to see if that was uh, produced by more than chance alone is, is your hypothesis test of choice. 
nine. All right. So for your binary data, you make a two by two table, right? Which is your effect size for binary outcomes. Um, if, for example, you have a relative, um, so the difference between relative risk and odds ratio is kind of subtle, but the best way to think about it is that your relative risk is sort of you looking forward in time, meaning you start collecting patients at the exposure and you follow them until the outcome. And your odds ratio is kind of you looking backwards in time, meaning you collect patients by their outcome and you go back and look at the exposure. So the classic example there would be, for example, something like fetal alcohol syndrome, right? Or, or you know, all those things that prenatal studies do. So you find people who have the outcome and then you do their you know, backward case chart review and see what exposures they had. So when you do that kind of a study, you um, should always describe it as an odds ratio, right? Meaning that you know, the odds of a person having um, you know, FAS is two times more likely with someone who's been exposed to alcohol and a person without the exposure. My, my, my example probably didn't work, but, but you guys understand. Whereas your relative risk means you can go forward in time. So you can give, you know, you can give everyone iron sprinkles and come back three years later and see who, who's anemic, and that would give you a relative risk. Um, if your outcome is very rare, less than two, 10%, then your odds ratio and your relative risk actually converge upon each other and they're very similar. And this is how you make your two by two table, right? You write the exposure as your rows, yes or no, and you write the outcome as your column, yes or no, and then you calculate your relative risk. Um, who can tell me how to calculate the relative risk on this data? Everyone take 30 seconds, take out your calculators. And I know it's so much harder to do this on Zoom, but let's, let's walk through it, right? So what you wanna do is you wanna say, what's your risk with the exposure relative to your risk without the exposure, all right? So your risk with the exposure of the outcome is 10 out of 50, right? So we don't know what the outcome is. Let's say it's, lung, let's say it's smoking and lung cancer, right? So if you've been exposed to cigarette smoking, your outcome of lung cancer is 10 out of 50. So it's sort of A over A plus B, right? And then all of that relative to your outcome if you've not had the exposure. So if you've not been smoking cigarettes, you get lung cancer five out of 50, right? So it's 10 out of 50 relative to five out of 50, which is two, right? So, you're, so you might say the relative risk of developing lung cancer if you've been smoking is two. Does that make sense to you? Your odds ratio, the easiest way to calculate that is sort of to do a cross product. So it's actually your A times D divided by uh, B times C. And it's a little, and that's sort of like what it collapses down to when you sort of work out the math, it's a little bit more than that, but the, but the cheat way is to, to sort of just do your cross product. And then perhaps we may not have time today to, to get into that, but you can see it'll sort of get you very close to two as well, right? So 10 times 45 is 450. Um, and 40 by five is 200. So we're talking about 450 over 200, which is what, um, 2.25 or something. So it's, so it converts, it's close to 10, but not absolute, not close to two, but not absolute. So the relative risk and the odds ratio were pretty close together. So, you know, RRs and ORs are probably a good, you know, exam question as well. So you should know in the back of your mind how to calculate those. And as you can see, I couldn't remember the formula. I just like to work it out every time, right? It's easier to actually do it in English than it is to do it in, in math. All right, so that's your effect size. Now, what exactly does hypothesis testing mean? Right? Hypothesis testing means, did I get this result by chance alone or is there a true effect of the, of the exposure or of the intervention? Um, it's basically saying, what, are the you know, what is the probability that I can reject the null hypothesis? We always, define, we always start by defining the null hypothesis, which means there's no difference between outcomes in group A and outcomes in group B. And why do we start by a null hypothesis? Simply because we have to, like it's the only practical option. You, can, you cannot actually prove no difference. And, and if you guys ever look at a sample size formula, you'll see that in a sample size formula, your denominator is delta squared, right? So delta is a difference um, in anything, right? In the mean or the proportion between your two groups. And then you square that. So if your delta squared, um, if your delta is zero, then your delta squared is zero squared. And then that's in the denominator, which means your sample size is infinity. So you cannot actually do a study that proves no difference because, um, um, 
because you'll need an infinite number of patients. So you can't actually prove the null hypothesis. So what do you do? You assume the null hypothesis and you try to prove the alternate, if that makes sense, right? And then you prove the alternate by, by doing these, these hypothesis tests to see if that result came by chance alone. So it's to determine the probability of observing data um, as or more extreme, assuming that the treatment does not work. So if your probability, your p-value is sufficiently small, and that's usually set by convention at 5% or less, then you can reject the null hypothesis, right? If your p-value is 0 0.04, then what you're saying is there's only a 4% chance that I would have observed this difference by chance alone, by random distribution alone. And so there's a 96% chance that some of this difference was caused by my intervention. So it's a sense of the confidence you have around your uh, effect size. But effect size and hypothesis testing are not the same. And this is perhaps the best way to appreciate that. Um, your, your doctor says, so supposing you have some horrible disease and your doctor is giving you this choice. Medicine A has a 95% confidence inter, uh, of improving your chances of survival by at least 2%. And medicine B has a 90% confidence of improving your chances of survival by at least 20%. So which of these would you choose if you were a patient? You know? I wish we were in a room and we could see a raise of hands, right? But the chances are you're gonna choose medicine B, right? Because that 20% seems so much more appealing than that 2%. But which of these would you publish if you were an editor, right? If you were an editor, you would say, well, medicine B did not achieve statistical significance. So I'm gonna publish medicine A, right? And so, you know, our big journals are full of, you know, um, you know large clinical trials that have P-values of 0 0.000001, but an effect size of 2%, right? Survival, and you get you know, breast cancer, a new drug, million dollars published in New England Journal of Medicine, but that's what the trial is. But that 20% survival improvement by the p-value of 0.1 will not get published in that same journal. So there's a little bit of a, if you will, you know, a funny culture around the, the way we prioritize effect size and hypothesis testing. And I just want, you know, we don't have to, change the world here, but I just want you guys to sort of appreciate that, that there is that difference. Here's a classic example from the pediatric oncology literature. So this was a randomized trial of cisplatin and Christine Floriosal C5V against cisplatin and doxorubicin, so a slightly more intensive treatment for pediatric hepatoblastoma. And regimen B was the doxorubicin regimen. And you can see that these curves are not the same, right? The regimen B is visually better than regimen A, right? I, I don't have the numbers here, but there's at least a 12% survival difference here, which is very meaningful in pediatric oncology. But look at that p-value, it's 0 0.09. So this paper actually concluded, and you can pull up the abstract and read the conclusion. The conclusion says, there was no difference between regimen A and regimen B, hence we will be continuing with regimen A for our next study. Then they did the next study, and then they published another paper called Reassessing the Role of Doxorubicin. And they said, well, we didn't quite like the way we published our first paper, so we're going to bring Doxorubicin back. So you can see that that effect size and that p-value are two different concepts, and you have to digest the difference between them to understand uh, a paper. All right, secondary analysis. So what a secondary analysis basically is, is you're adjusting for confounders. Um, so, and generally, the more complex, uh, um, sorry, the, the more complex analysis that attempts to adjust for the effects of other covariables um, is the um, is your secondary analysis. So, you're generally trying to adjust for confounders. Now, what is a confounder? This is the statistical definition. It's an extraneous variable in a statistical model that correlates with both the dependent variable and the independent variable, not being an intermediate step between them, and that affects the apparent relationship between the predictor and the outcome variable. So that's quite a mouthful. It doesn't really mean anything, but I'm, um, I'm going to work through, I, I, we're running a bit short on time, but I'd love to work through this mathematical example to actually give you guys a, you know, you know, slam dunk on what actually is happening at the level of a confounder. So here's a two by two table we saw, right? And we decided that the relative risk here is two, right? And you can see now the exposure is coffee and the outcome is lung cancer. So if you had this data, you would say coffee has a relative risk of two for lung cancer. All right, clearly that's what the numbers show. But what if one of your colleagues was to be like, you know, I wonder if coffee is being confounded by something else, or is coffee itself is a confounder for something else? Um, and what if there's an underlying variable that's actually uh, you know, determining this apparent association? 
and they might, so, so, so this would say show you coffee causes lung cancer. But imagine if someone says, hey, let's stratify this, i.e. let's adjust it by cigarette smoking. And so you say, okay, I'm going to take these 100 patients and I'm going to break them into smokers and non-smokers. And lo and behold, they happen to be 50 smokers and 50 non-smokers. And I'm going to do the analysis again. All right. So among the 50 smokers, if someone wants to pull out a calculator, you know, your relative risk with coffee exposure, if you're a smoker, is 6 out of 30, right? So that's 20%. And... If you're not a uh, if you're not a coffee drinker, your relative risk is four out of twenty, and that's twenty percent, right? So, hmm, when I broke it down into the stratum, my coffee's relative risk became one. What, are the, what about here? What about the fifty non-smokers? Okay, fifty non-smokers, lung cancer. So, if they're coffee drinkers, their relative risk is two out of twenty, so that's ten percent. And if they're non-smokers, the relative risk is three out of 30, and that's 10%. Hmm, so my coffee relative risk here became one. So when I stratify by smokers and non-smokers, my relative risk, apparent relative risk of coffee drinking goes away, it disappears. What about the actual relative risk of smoking and lung cancer? Is there a way we can find that? Well, let's see, we know we have 50 smokers, and among those 50 smokers, how many developed lung cancer? I'm uh, sorry, 50 non-smokers. So among the 50 non-smokers, we had five lung cancer. And among the 50 smokers, we had 10 lung cancers. So the smokers actually have 10 out of 50 or 20%, and the non-smokers have five out of 50 or 10%. So your relative risk is actually being carried by the cigarette smoking. So do you guys see how cool that was? Like in, you know, in three two by two tables, we actually saw confounding in action. Right? So the lung cancer coffee relative risk that you saw here, and these are all real numbers, right? They'll work out, you know, I haven't, I haven't faked the numbers. Um, these numbers all add up to each other. But, but you see that the relative risk of the coffee drinking goes away and the relative risk of the cigarette smoking comes into play. And now what you would say is that apparent uh, association between coffee drinking and lung cancer was, was false. It was, it was a confounder. And the real association is between smoking and lung cancer and between smoking and coffee drinking. So let's go back. Does coffee drinking correlate with smoking? Well, let's see. So among the 50 smokers, right? If you're a smoker, the chances that you drink coffee is 30 out of 50. If you're a non-smoker, the chances you drink coffee is 20 out of 50. So yes, there's a 1.5 relative risk of being a coffee drinker and a smoker. I say this as I drink my coffee. Um, so as you can see, there's an association here an association here, and these two associations is what gave you that false association. And that, guys, is what a confounder is, and that's why you adjust for confounders. You never rely just on your primary. If, if you had published this paper, you'd be relying on your primary analysis without your secondary analysis, and you'd be getting a false result. And so that's what we are trying to do when we talk about about regression, right? The regression is the most common method of, of adjustment, um, but, but another word for it is multivariable analysis, right? So, so your primary analysis is your univariate analysis, and your secondary analysis is your multivariate analysis. And so there's many ways to do it. The, the, you know, the old-fashioned way is stratification, which is exactly what we just did in the coffee example. Another way is matching, which is sort of upfront adjustment at the level of the study design. But the most common method now is regression, right? Just because the numbers, you know, we do such big studies and the numbers get so complicated that regression basically means your statistical software doing the stratification for you. So most of you don't have to know how to do a regression. Um, if you're doing a master's in cleanup, you'll learn how to use software. You'll learn how to write R or, you know, SAS or, or SPSS, and you'll learn how to do these regression codes. Um, but otherwise, if you're not, planning you know, a complicated research career, you have to find someone to do it for you, right? So you hire a statistician or a buddy. Um, and so you know, linear regression, basically, you know, it's, it's, your, it's your line equation, right? So why, this is what I showed you, if you have a continuous outcome and a continuous predictor, what you're really doing with linear regression is you're making a line equation, uh, y equals a plus beta one x one, and that's your primary analysis. But if you add plus beta two x two plus beta two x three, you're beginning your linear regression. And that's all I'll leave it there for now. 
if your if logistic regression came, sort of came out of linear regression, um, but statisticians noticed that if you you can't create a line of best fit between you know between two categorical variables because you've got your your zeros are distributed here, and your ones are distributed up there. But if you attempt to draw a lawn of best fit, uh, like a logarithmic S curve of best fit, you can get you can get a best fit lawn. Uh, you know, across this data, and then you can start regressing on that. So it's still a linear regression that's been logarithmatized. That's all I'm going to explain about that. Uh, read your statistics book if you need more. But the idea is that's how, you know, that's the underlying mathematics of logistic regression. And I'm not even going to get into the underlying mathematics of Cox proportional hazards regression, uh, but the idea is uh, very similar. Uh, we have six minutes left. Um, and your Cox proportional hazard regression produces a hazard ratio. So sorry, I should just emphasize that your logistic regression produces an odds ratio. Oh, sorry. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, I think the time is working out because I'm almost done. So now I'm sort of summarizing everything we've said. So if you have a continuous outcome variable as your primary outcome variable, right, meaning the severity of your headaches, then you're going to say, um, you know, in this paper, we will describe uh, predictor and outcome variables using mean and standard deviation for normally distributed or median range for non-normally distributed data. We will describe, uh, we will graphically portray the study using scatter plots, line plots, uh, and box and whisker plots. The primary analysis will be the mean difference in headache severity between group A and group B. We will um, test for statistical significance using the, you know, t-test if they're normally distributed or the Wilcoxon rank sum test if the outcome is non-normally distributed. And we will use a linear regression to perform multivariable, multivariable adjustment um, on the you know, potential confounding variables of you know, gender and blood pressure and history of migraine, et cetera. And that's your analysis. Same thing for binary outcome. Um, we will describe this uh, summary statistics of our outcome, you know, um, number of um, you know, people with headaches using frequency and percentages. <coughs> we'll describe the difference between the two groups using relative risks or odds ratios and test for significance um, uh, using the chi-square test or the Fisher's exact test if the cell size is less than five. We'll portray the graphical results using two by two tables, bar charts and, and pie charts. And we will adjust for potential confounders, including so and so and so using logistic regression. Time to event data. We will summarize our um, outcomes using median survival time, the five-year event-free survival, um, plus minus standard error or cumulative incidence. We will describe the effect size as the survival difference between group A and group B. We will portray the results graphically using kaplan meier curves. Uh, we will test for the significance of the survival difference using the log rank test. And we will adjust for multivariable, uh, uh, you know, we will adjust for confounders using multivariable regression with the Cox proportional hazards regression. And that's just another example of, of everything I just said, right? Um, so the distribution of variables will be described as mean and range or median and percentages. The effects of chemotherapy will be described as odds ratios with 95% confidence interval. Um, uh, the effects of potential covariates such as age, gender, and stage will be determined using logistic regression. You can add a line about all tests will be two-sided using a significance level of 0.05. No adjustment will be made for multiple comparison. And then you can add your sample size uh, calculation, which as I said, you can get off of uh, online calculators as well. Um, here's some resources. So Vanderbilt has a nice power and sample size calculator that you can use. There's a free online software called Open Epi. Excel actually has a lot of statistical add-ins that you can download and do some basic stats with. Many people don't actually know this, but you can just you know, just Google Excel statistical add-in. Um, if you want to know how to report uh, papers, you should use the Equator Network for reporting guidelines. And of course, when you're writing a paper, you should get some EndNote. And that's all. I'm happy here to take any questions. I hope this was useful, guys. Thanks so much for giving me the opportunity. Thanks so much, Furkan. That was fantastic. It was a great uh, crash course on uh, stats. Um, so I'm wondering, I am gonna, oh, I know, mindful of the time, we only have a few minutes, but um, if anybody has a question, feel free to uh, maybe um, unmute yourself and ask the question or text it in through the chat. I don't have a question, but I want to say thank you. I feel like that was so clear and really, really helpful. Oh, thank you.
So with that said, I'm just going to look like I'm going to go wing once, going twice. No, no takers. Okay. Well, thank you so much for can for that fantastic session. Um, if anybody is looking for some additional information um, on stats, maybe something a little bit more in depth, uh, CCHCSP does have a pre-recorded webinar called Statistical Error and Data Representation by David L. Uh, Schreiner from, um, I believe, McMaster. I believe he's now retired. So you feel free to visit www.cchcsp.ca. Go to our webinars tab and, and take a listen to that. Um, otherwise, I'm going to thank everybody for joining us for our first session and remind everyone of our next session that's going to be taking place on Wednesday, February the 24th from 1.30 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Again, this time we will be discussing building your professional brand um, with Dr. Christine Chambers, Dr. Katie Burney, and Carrie Taffin. And again, I apologize. Homeschooling, that's my son. And with that... Goodbye and thank you everyone for joining us today.